Good morning, everybody. Uh, and for the people online, I don't know which people are online, but I assume they are in the same time zone as us. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure if our European colleagues got up, but then that would really be very early. Um, my name is Katharin Tjewischa van Scheltinga. I work at Wageningen University and Research. I think you are all more or less a bit familiar with Wageningen. Uh, and in Wageningen, uh, within the uh, setting there, I'm with the environmental sciences and then in a team on water and food. And we do different uh, type of work, um, actually all from modeling uh, water and food related uh, issues up to kind of science policy interface and capacity development. Uh, today, uh, we have a kind of special situation for our Delta Talks to be live. Uh, that's a very nice thing. Uh, this venue is also very nice. Uh, because I have a bit of a cold, I asked them to switch off the AC. Uh, it got very quiet, so I think it was managed. I hope you are all sufficiently cool. Can I see hands if you are okay? Yeah, okay, thank you. And in case you feel hot, then please notify and we will switch it back on. And in the meantime, we are saving the environment, right? A and my throat, thank you so much. Um, for our uh, session today, we have uh, four speakers. I think we have the four presentations already on the system. In case your presentation is not yet on the system, please make sure that it gets there. And um, I would like to call the first speaker, Dr. Bui Tan Yen, um, to let us know about exploring the local understanding of climate risks and developing site-specific adaptation plan using CSMAP approach. Yeah. I will be terribly rude on you and interrupt you when you talk too long. Is that okay? Yeah. By eight minutes, I will give you six. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Train, for your introduction. So uh, I'm happy to um, uh, to be on behalf of uh, this research team, including uh, colleagues from Iri, One Piece, and also um, Zide in Cambodia, uh, to uh, share with you our uh, activity on the IMD uh, initiatives in uh, Cambodia. The topic uh, of my presentation uh, today is to uh, how we explore the climatics uh, uh, in Cambodia and connect it with the adaptation uh, option. Next, please. Uh, I would like to give you some background information of the uh, study site in Cambodia. Uh, it's uh, include four provinces in the southern part of Cambodia, including Takeo, Kandan, Preveng, and Spreyang. Uh, it's a part of Mekong Delta. It's one of the three major uh, um, Delta, big Delta in, in Asia. The main uh, food production in these uh, four provinces is uh, rice. And uh, in the area, we also see uh, some of uh, cash crops like cassava, maize, vegetable, and and uh, uh, other, uh, together with uh, some small uh, fish spawn for aquaculture. Next, please. Uh, the area in in um, particularly have uh, uh, some climate tricks. Uh, that we can see clearly from the statistic uh, over uh, 26 years. Uh, from the, the chart on the left-hand side, you can see that the statistic show the flood, fire, storm, drought, niling, and, and other. But in terms of indirect and direct effects, so most uh, severe climate risks in, in Cambodia 
its blood and droughts account for 81% and 17% uh, of the affect. Uh, then it's, uh, can, um, we can also see clearly from the, the map is number of common affectors and map with a very high um, um, uh, dark color in the southern part in the study area that we focus under AMD. Next, please. Uh, so we know that climate is uh, um, drought and floods is uh, the major problem in Cambodia. And how far we study about this uh, climate problem? Uh, through uh, literature review, we, we see that uh, there are several studies already done in Cambodia, uh, uh, implemented by uh, national and also international uh, research institutes. Uh, so here uh, we can show some example of the uh, flood research and also drought research in Cambodia. But problem is uh, the risk warning and, and uh, prediction available, accessible, but not often translated into the agricultural advisory properly. Uh, so for manager and for policy maker, they hardly can understand the index provided by this study to convert into the action because not everyone uh, have expertise on climate risk and also in, in our country. So it were technically, uh, technically defined without considering specific food products. For example, if you look at the, the map here, it's so very general index and you do not know what this index for because crop have a different uh, tolerance and respond to climate risk. If we do not link the, the risk with the, the, uh, the objects like a crop or other food product, then very hard to uh, clearly understand the risk and this uh, uh, effect. Uh, the impact of climate risk also vary depend on the ready net of infrastructure and also the uh, farming practice. For example, if you have already the good uh, preventive system like irrigation for uh, to, to, to cope with the drought or dike system to, to protect the land from a flood, then the effect is very low. So the one important thing is that we have to evaluate the, the risk, uh, uh, considering the, the readiness of the uh, um, system there, of, of, of infrastructure and also farming practice. Next, please. Next. Yeah, that's why we, we see that to connect the gap between the scientific study and also understanding and action option on the, uh, on the ground, we need a com to know the common understanding of the risk and their uh, effect uh, of, to, to the food production. That's why we, we need to use a participatory approach. Uh, here, uh, with the uh, participatory approach, we, we try to, to answer the question, what is the common understanding of the risk? How do local people define the risk level? Because people uh, are from different uh, expertise and they can understand uh, one uh, thing very differently. Uh, what are the uh, potential uh, losses in our control production, considering current adoption and so farming practice and less or infrastructure. Uh, what are the uh, feasible adaptive plan of the local people considering all of, of uh, size specific uh, characteristic in, in the area? Uh, uh, when and where do the adaptive options work, work well? So to do this, we apply one uh, approach we call uh, CS map, uh, climate mass mapping of climate risk and adaptation plan. Next, please. Uh, this approach, uh, including five steps. The first step, we work with the uh, uh, local uh, stakeholder to identify climate risks. The second step, we define boundary and the risk level using uh, the paper map. 
Uh, third step, we we encourage uh, stakeholders to um, prom uh, promote uh, adaptation plan for particular area, considering the risk level and the potential effect of the risk. And the four, uh, four step, we uh, refine the adaptation plan on and also uh, climate uh, risk level with a larger a group of stakeholders by presenting uh, initial output to uh, to, to expose in each district to get the feedback, their feedback on uh, on the work. And finally, integrate adaptation plan and also uh, uh, feedback from uh, local stakeholder in the uh, larger context, we call it a regional scale. In Cambodia, uh, we uh, merge the map of four provinces that I saw uh, earlier into like uh, southern uh, Cambodia uh, region for rice production. Next, please. So, multi stakeholder dialogue is a backbone of a uh, map approach. Next. Next, please. Uh, for the first step, what is common understanding of the clim climate risk? We uh, organize uh, the dialogue with the local um, uh, officer come from the district and also province. Well, we do it in each pro province in Cambodia. So first we raise the issue of, of uh, two mother, mother climate risks, drought and floods, and ask them what is their understanding. And we come up with a discussion to define and to to, to find one uh, single de definition that everyone can understand and can translate it well. Uh, so uh, we do not look at the uh, very technical uh, indicator of flood or drought, uh, but we uh, uh, link the effect of uh, of uh, climate risk with the uh, of the losses potential losses. For example, here, if a flood that uh, costs uh, fifty percent of the year loss is defines uh, high. Uh, district and province uh, officer in 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 Cambodia. Next, please. Uh, <clears throat> We uh, we use as definition and and draw the boundary of the area affected uh, potentially affected by flood and drought on the map. Uh, we use three. Uh, we we uh, connect to the three main uh, food product. Uh, so uh, so depend on the province. Uh, food product can be rice, uh, maize, vegetable, cassava, sugarcane. And look at the two climate sun scenario, the normal year and for the extreme year. We all work as a district level. Yeah. Next, please. Uh, the output of uh, of uh, the first step uh, look like this. We are going to have a different color showing different effect of climatic high, moderate, low, and no uh, affected. For example, the area in the red circle there in a normal year is not affected by, by uh, floods, but in extreme year is converted to some part is to very high risk and some part is uh, low risk. Next, please. Uh, this, we did the same for, for drought. Also look at the normal and extreme year and how the distribution of the uh, potential effect in both provinces. Next, please. Uh, based on the based on the the, the um, uh, map of climate risk, we work with the local stakeholder from the district to prioritize the adaptation measure. So for each uh, small area, they can can um, uh, make a table of success that is the uh, adaptation measure. For example, here is uh, for the changing crop uh, in calendar. Crop tie, crop variety, uh, um, uh, minus uh, water like uh, canals or fresh water storage, uh, have a product diversification, include the uh, livestock, fishery, etc. Next, please. 
we then bring the output from the discussion with the district and province level to the community in four provinces. So work with the farmer to verify if the succession from the officer is uh, work uh, in, the, uh, in the local context. So farmer, including men and women, when look at the, uh, the output, the succession of adaptation measure, and they suggest what is uh, applicable in the area and what's the effect to the men and women workload. Next, please. Uh, final climate fix map adaptation plans would look like this. We can uh, have uh, some indicators showing the map and uh, uh, define the distribution of adaptation measure on, on the area. We already have a um, uh, ZAS map with the own information stored in, in the map object and we, we make it available to access online very soon. Next, please. Uh, the individual output and outcome. I have a, one more slide. This or one more? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what are implemented in four uh, provinces in Cambodia, as uh, uh, I saw, national partner were trained on uh, the approach and can conduct it by themselves later on. Uh, the map. Uh, of the four provinces have been co-developed with the government agency. And uh, we get very high interest from the, the uh, military and have the request to scale out of the, the AMD uh, study site, mean that uh, it can be applied scale to other provinces in Cambodia. Next, please. The key message is my last slide, sorry. <laughs> CSCS map is a participatory approach, so it's not the map. Using CSCS map can uh, uh, can be uh, be done in the in the different level. This can be done in the common district or, or province level, uh, depend on the purpose. Uh, CSCS map approach is a low cost, easy to implement and can be quickly uh, implemented in the local with a very uh, low uh, input. Uh, this map can translate trick and adaptation plan into no technical language, allow the wider range of, of user, for, for example, policy maker, local authority, and also farmer can understand and take ac action when the, they have a warning of climatrics. The output of map can be used as a quick reference for developing a short-term adaptive action. One, uh, they receive the early uh, risk warning, for, for example, that the seasonal forecast. Uh, the output of map can also be used to inform the uh, hotspot of climate risk for the long-term intervention. Thank you. That is my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bui, for this very interesting presentation on the CS map approach in Cambodia. Um, we now move on to our second speaker, um, uh, Dr. Amjad Bambu, who will talk to us about Agvaisali. Uh, can you, I invite you to the speech, to the stage, and is your slide already on the system? Yeah, I think we're in Thank you. Uh, my name is Amjit Babu. Uh, this is my first Delta talk, and uh, I'll be talking about building farming system resilience through climate services. Uh, the example here is Agwaisley. Uh, can you go to the next slide? What you're seeing here is uh, the decision frame of a Bangladeshi farmer. Okay. So he's a wheat farmer, and what you can see is he is planting, he's irrigating, he's uh, applying fertilizers, and he's harvesting. And all of these actions are taking place in interaction with various weather thresholds, which I mark in red. Sometimes there, there can be rainfall or a uh, for example, in the flowering stage, 
there could be a terminal heat stress that can impact the total yield. Or there could be a rainfall at the harvest period that can destroy some of his crops. Or it can be fertilizer application, which is washed away because of uh, heavy rainfall. So if you know about these events beforehand, this is forecasting, the farmer can actually behave in a climate smart way and produce increased output. That means for the same level of output, inputs, you can see a different level of art output for a climate smart farmer. So uh, we have to see that we can provide this information to farmer. We have a system for that. So that's why we need climate information services. And what I need to tell you is the value of each piece of information is different. So you cannot expect that information given to avoid a terminal heat stress will be different from a, a advice for changing the fertilization rate, for example. And another question is why digital? You know, so uh, you can give this information to farmers through digital platforms like Advisely, but why digital? Because if you, for example, if you have a call center that's calling farmers every day, three hours, if you think about the cost for calling 100,000 farmers or a million farmers, it's too high. So you need a digital platform to inform farmers in advance what kind of climate smart decision he can he or she can take. It In Agwisely, we have this crop services. Also, same thing for livestock and aquaculture. I'll explain to you uh, later. And uh, the climate change is making uh, these services more valuable because in a year, where, the, where there is not much, you know, not much stress, uh, not uh, stress thresholds are broken, it means the information has very less value. You know, so in years where the climate availability is very high, the information is really valuable. So you cannot have the same value for a climate service in a given year. So every year it fluctuates. Some years is so high, and climate change is making it more valuable. Can you go to the next slide? No, uh, there'll be another slide before this. Yes, no, no, before that. So next. Okay, uh, so Agwisely is uh, having, uh, I mean, I will give you some impact numbers for Agwisely. The Agwisely application in Bangladesh has 10 crops, including all cereal crops, mung bean, uh, mustard, and potatoes for all over Bangladesh, for all Ubazilla level. That means it's at to the, for the weather forecast included in uh, the Agwai system is downscale, downscale up to Ubazilla. And now the registered users are approximately 8,000 extension officers uh, of DAE. And we calculate the reach can be up to 500,000 farmers. So uh, it has a really good reach. And now we are with the Asian Mega Delta project. We have actually added livestock into the system. That means the livestock farmers can also access climate smart information. And once it is scale, it can help thousands or even millions of farmers. And it has capacity to provide aquaculture service also, but now it's not uh, right now not active because uh, we need reference point temperature to predict water temperatures. So Agwaisley has is using air, tem air temperatures and rainfall forecast for crops and the THI or temperature humidity index and uh, temperature and rainfall for livestock and water temperatures and rainfall for uh, uh, for, for aquaculture. But, but to predict water temperatures, we need uh, additional information, especially pond uh, reference point temperature uploads, uh, which is not happening right now, but hopefully we can integrate or revive this service soon. Okay, <laughs> next. Okay, I said, uh, uh, you know, I, I think there is a missing slide here, but it, it showed the uh, interface of Agwisely. So there uh, you can see that um, uh, the, uh, the interface is really simple. So you, you have this, uh, you have to just download the application select your location and the crop and the stage of the crop, then you will get, get the advisory. But the back end is very, very, very complex. Uh, we are getting gridded forecast data from Bangladesh Meteorological Department. We are downscaling it to Bazilla level. 
then our system is searching for thresholds. Uh, so if there is a threshold within five days of uh, forecast, you will actually see it in the system. And it is, you can actually, uh, anybody who is opening app can actually share it as a PDF file. Can you go to the next one? So we also did an experiment with women. How can we make it more inclusive for women? So we have, uh, okay, last slide, okay. Uh, can you go to the last slide? Uh, it just shows the future plans. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, the future plan is to add uh, the good agriculture practices in the system and also uh, the uh, integrating new source of data. Uh, so, yeah, I just have to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amjad Babu, for your presentation here. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, especially on the slide where the importance of the role of women in your advisory program was mentioned. So we will be following it up and maybe somebody will ask a question later about it, right? Then he still will be able to tell that important part. Um, in light of time, I'm just moving along and I'm very happy to invite uh, Nozumi from the CIP team, who will be speaking on breeding innovations on roads and tubers in saline affected areas in the deltas. Nozumi, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm too short to stand in this. You cannot see. So I have a mic microphone here. Uh, we will wait uh, for the slide, but we are going to introduce our sheep breeding innovations. Uh, our colleague uh, Ulfgan is here uh, from Peru. Uh, he came so he can also complement our presentation. So the photos, uh, right side, uh, left side is a West Bengal uh, potato zero tillage, uh, growing potatoes. And then the right side is a currently ongoing breeding selection uh, of sweet potatoes. Uh, Sohak, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, we are trying to uh, scaling zero tillage potato in uh, uh, our working area in Southern Delta of Bangladesh and side by side SSRI in uh, also introducing or scaling this uh, technology in West Bengal. And uh, uh, we, we are also in, in, trying to introduce in Vietnam and Cambodia also. Uh, next slide, please. So usually this is a uh, uh, two rice uh, and then fallow in Vietnam, but in Bangladesh, uh, while we are working, uh, usually rice fallow, uh, 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 only one crop is growing due to the increase of salinity and lack of irrigation water. Uh, next slide, please. So what we uh, did actually, uh, immediately after rice harvesting, uh, we try to uh, put the potato in the muddy soil and keep uh, cover with a very uh, little amount of organic matter and then cover with the soil. This is very uh, gender friendly and women can do this because this is not laborious work. And by this way, they can, uh, they can uh, reduce, uh, uh, extend the uh, uh, potato growing season. And this technology actually uh, uh, improve uh, the soil uh, conservation, our research say that 40% moisture they, uh, by using zero tillage, uh, they can preserve the soil and increase the soil organic matter and uh, extend the soil potato, grow, uh, potato growing uh, uh, period. So by this way, after rice harvesting, we can get a crop uh, and farmers are happy to introduce this. Uh, uh, next slide, please. And in, during the harvesting time, uh, we try to uh, invite the farmers, uh, nearby farmers, to see the uh, yield uh, by their own. And uh, this is uh, this technology also very helpful in the salinity area to reduce the salinity also. So uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Uh, so uh, we uh, actually developed three saline tolerant potato variety. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, from the CIP clone. Uh, the variety is Barialu 72, 73, and 78. Uh, 72 is mainly uh, highly saline tolerant. It's around uh, 10 ds per mole of salinity can tolerate during the harvesting time, not in the planting time. Planting time, they can tolerate up to 3 uh, ds uh, salinity level. And the yield is more or less uh, 20 to 25 metric tons per hectare. In the farmer's field, uh, average yield uh, we received last year around 15 metric tons per hectare. And the farmers are very much enthusiastic. 
and one uh, two pri uh, private seed companies, Supreme Seed Company and SCI. They are trying to produce the variety uh, to market and also uh, public uh, sectors like BADC and Bari also producing this uh, seeds of this variety. So seeds are available uh, and we, we try to introduce this variety in our area. And next slide, please. Uh, good morning and greetings from CIP and Bangladesh Agriculture University. So we are doing uh, sweet potato breeding for short duration. Uh, I'm grateful to Olgang and his team for uh, providing thousands of seeds from nine families bred in CIP and we grew them, we germinated them in, in the laboratory and grew the seedlings in the greenhouse. And finally, we uh, took 540 genotypes, selected genotypes in the field. Uh, we did four mega experiments, including 540 genotypes and check varieties, and that uh, two, three applications that made uh, over 200, 2,000 genotypes in an experiment. We did in two seasons in two locations, then four experiment was conducted, and finally we selected 60 genotypes from this experiment. And after uh, subsequent screening, we have now uh, 12 selected genotypes. Next, next slide, please. So here, here you see uh, in the borrow season, uh, farmers need 140 to 50 days. But if we can uh, select finally and uh, release the short duration varieties bred in CIP, we can actually uh, provide farmers 90 days varieties, and they, those will be high yielding as well. So next slide, please. So we have now a large uh, different jump plasms in our hand, and we have selected finally 12 genotypes. These are high yielding. Most of the most of the genotypes are orange flesh, some of those purple flesh, and white flesh as well. And they can provide uh, more than 20 tons per hectare yield. So we are at the final round of selection, and I hope we can release three to five genotypes though, and two will be orange flesh, high or high uh, carotin, low carotin, and the purple fish anthocyanin and white fresh genotypes uh, within this year. We have also released a bow sweet potato to five uh, last year that is uh, that can give up to 35 to 40 ton yield uh, potentially and farmers field we are getting to 25 to 30 tons yield. So this is also a very high yielding variety. Uh, uh, yeah, and it can be also grown in the round year, but um, uh, high yield is obtained in rubbish season. Uh, next slide, please. No, Jimmy. So, uh, main challenge is the seed systems. Uh, for sweet potatoes, you can cut vines and plant, but for potatoes, we have to carry tons of uh, tons of potatoes from the northern highland to the Bengal Delta regions where they don't grow potatoes. So, innovation can be using epical roots cuttings, uh, nursery of the uh, nursery of potatoes uh, that can save cost and create uh, create income opportunities for women and also reduce the risk of diseases. So, but we haven't tried this technology in Delta region and in zero tillage context. So this next cropping season with collaboration with ERI and CSSRI, we will try this one in uh, West Bengal. So we still have time, uh, right? Yes. Okay, so Ulfgan, you will speak about the uh, sweet potato breeding. Uh, next slide, please. Whoops. Yeah, anyway, you can speak no, no. So I, my slides are over there on my computer. <laughs> so um, what regarding innovations, I want to, to mention something that in sweet potato, uh, as a, everyone here in the audience should know sweet potatoes propagated by wine cuttings to 95%. Sometimes cuttings are coming from stored storage routes over the winter, for example, in, in North Carolina. So, uh, but uh, it is it is so sweet potato is not planted as true seed, so it's very tiny, small true seed. Um, and one innovation, I think, over the past decade and implemented in Africa, is 
that we use the principles of hybrid breeding to sweet potato. This sounds strange. Please, as a, there are not many breeders here, I assume. Perhaps we are only two. Um, and it is so that to apply the principles and then to produce what they call it in maize population hybrids. So these are is for sweet potato in an intermediate product. You have a population which is in principle extracted from your original population, and this is an elite population. And this is sent out as true seed. And what everyone should know here is this by true seed, you have no virus transmission. So all the restrictions, it is much easier to send genetic gains out to the world by true seed. But then locally, uh, you, you need good partners, as Robin here, who are locally then within this elite, elite population selecting. So it's not a uh, uh, random, it is you have selected an elite population uh, on basis of the offspring, as a parental offspring information. Uh, and this is an elite family for very short duration, orange flesh and other potential attributes within sweet potato, such as drought, heat, or salinity toler toler tolerance. So th this is a, an innovation. And with this here, we are getting very close to select, also to release the first uh, hybrid clone variety. It's very difficult. There are uh, uh, green crops hybrids, but there can be also clone crop hybrids. And this is one. And I think we are very short to release the first one for 90 days harvest. This is also an attribute in hybrids. They are faster than the traditional varieties. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Can I have a big hand for this whole team who, with four speakers, managed within the time? Compliments. Okay. I go back to the list. Uh, we are doing well on time. Uh, and we have one more interesting presentation to go. Can I uh, invite speaker number four on Khmer Agriculture for the Future? Jim Titamak from Impact Hub, right? Please. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a little bit different from everyone else. I'm not a researcher, no, I'm from like agricultural background. I'm actually from an entrepreneurship background where what I'm working at is focusing on supporting entrepreneurs, supporting startups in Cambodia to be more equipped in terms of like building their own startups and building their own business as well. So again, introducing myself a bit, my name is Amata. Uh, a fun fact, it means immortal in Khmer language, just so uh, for your information. And I'm actually quite honored and happy to be here to listen to a lot of great minds. I believe I'm the youngest one here, I believe. So uh, being here, listening to a lot of great minds and insights and innovations happening and being researched by a lot of people from different backgrounds, it really opens up a lot of ideas and a lot of innovations that can happen as well. So if you can go on to my slide, I have some few informations that I want to share as well. So I don't have a research projects or uh, an innovations happening, but uh, we did a program uh, with uh, the support from Iri from Cambodia. And the program is called Datnam. 
So what the program uh, is about, I'll share a little bit later, but I'll share with you some interesting insights first. So may you go on to the next slide. So uh, these are some of the information and data that I would like to share a little bit. So in Cambodia, there's like 75% of the populations are living in rural areas, not in the capital city or in the big city area. And 25% of those, the labors that we have are involved in agriculture. So what does that mean? We are heavily involved in agriculture, but however, we have a lot of problems with agriculture every day as well. So some of the problems that we found out as well is that, uh, wait, you go on to the next slide. So the problem that we found out is that most of the agricultural practices that are being implemented in Cambodia nowadays are still using traditional methods. And at the same time, they have problems accessing to market because there's a lot of importations of vegetables and other products from outside of the countries. And another problem that we found out as well is that there is an aging population of farmers. Most of the uh, most of the uh, labor force and also like the populations uh, who are very young, who are in their youth, they are not interested or are not involved in agriculture, which is one of our big economic uh, uh, contribution as well. So we come up with a question. May you go on to the next slide? We come up with a question. So what happens or how do we inspire the next generations of youth to be interested in solving agriculture challenge using innovation and entrepreneurship altogether? So we come up with a program called, can you go on to the next slide? We call it Adam Innovator for Resilient Agriculture. And this is a startup program. We plan to instill young people's mind with entrepreneurship, uh, entrepreneurial mindsets, and at the same time, teach them about climate resilient agriculture practices. And what the program works or how does it work is that we first, we ideate their ideas with a hackathon, and then we push their ideas further with a business incubation. And then at the end of the day, we hope to launch their business into the next stage and business or service into the next stage as well. So if you go on to the next stage, so the area of focuses that we are focusing on are mainly on agri-tech, renewable energies, climate smart pest, uh, agri-byproduct processing, water efficient irrigation, and also like many others like agricultural machinery as well. So these are some of the areas that we would love the participants, specifically youth, to join and come up with some ideas regarding this and make it into like a startup ideas as well. Next slide. So like I mentioned, it follows so many, uh, it follows like a few steps. First, we do like a hackathon where we bring all of the youth from different backgrounds all together. And then afterwards, we will select from some teams to go on to the next stage, which is the masterclass and mentoring. If you go on to the next slide. So we will train them further. We will equip them with more business uh, trainings and also like capacity building in order for them to be able to launch their own startup afterwards. At the same time, we also provide some field trips for the next slide. We provide them some field trips for them to understand a little bit further into like the ecosystem, how to best work with farmers, how to best work in this uh, industry. And next, we go on to like a demo day where the participants comes up and they share about their findings and also like their uh, progress so far throughout their whole journey as well. And last but not least, we don't just leave them there. We provide post-program support as well. So we try to make sure that, hey, they got enough support, they know what to do, they have the network, that they, they have the uh, product launch. These are what we're gonna support them after the program end as well. So may you go on to the next slide? Okay, next one. Okay, so these, uh, interestingly, before coming here, we just wrapped our hackathon. It was a three days hackathon where we bring youth from different backgrounds all together, like from agriculture, from technologies, from business, from marketing, those kinds of backgrounds from different places call come together and then we put them into a room where they work on ideas related to climate resilient agriculture and we had a lot of sharing we had a lot of ideations and uh maybe go on to the next slide and most of the participations like more than 60 percent of them are uh, females and all of them are youth under the age of 30. So this is the, this is an interesting uh, insight that we found is that a lot of youth are interested in uh, agriculture and that coming together, bring, uh, bringing them all here together shows a really, really good signs of, hey, this is the next stage going forward. This is the next step going forward is equipping youth with the knowledge and at the same time with the skills to, in order to make sure that this can happen as well. So if you go on to the next stage, 
So these are just some uh, of the prototypes and also like some of the uh, uh, startup ideas that they had come up with. So one of the teams, they, uh, they, they did an AI chatbot to help farmers to identify the disease on the leaf of the, uh, the, the, the crops. For example, if you put uh, a picture of what the disease on the crop is, it will show like a text saying like what it is, but at the same time, we understand the problem that, hey, farmers cannot read, some of the farmers cannot read, some of the farmers cannot uh, understand any of this. So they did implement a voice chat where it automatically tells the farmers like, hey, this is uh, what disease it is and how it works. Telegram is very big in Cambodia and everyone pretty much has a Telegram. So this solves their problem as well. And some of the other teams, they come up with the idea of doing like nanotech into implementing nanotech into like liquid fertilizer to make sure that the yields can produce more and also like the effect of it can also make it uh, more effective for the crops as well. So again, these are just some ideas that just come up from a three days hackathon and uh, what could happen if we have more of this and what could have happened if we have more uh, of this youth coming together and build something like this as well. So we have some of our teams who are got selected to join the next stage of the incubation program, and we will help support them further to make sure that they actually launch this product outside into the market as well. So just a final closing remark, going to the next slide. So again, the future of uh, Khmer agriculture relies on youth, and this is what we want to do, and this is what we want to uh, implement and make it scale even further in Cambodia as well. So thank you. What a roller coaster ride. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Tita Matak, for this very interesting presentation. This shows us again that for making change, we do not only need the researchers, right? We need many types of activities. And all together, all the presentations together show us how we have different type of activities that together, in a way, are making the change. Um, we are having some time for questions. So I'm asking the speakers of all the four presentations, can you please come in the front here on the, the, the stage so that we can take some questions and then we can, and we can have all four, team four, uh, team three or four, you can come all. I'm that Babu, Dr. Bui, Mr. Tita Matak. He's doing his business. He's exchanging cards. Very good. Uh, you will be joining us too. I saw a hand. Uh, I need an extra handheld microphone. Yes. Uh, I'm first taking the question. Uh, if I can see more hands, I will be taking some more questions. Let me come to you. Thank you. My, my question is for the CS map. Say your name. All right, sorry. My name is Mike Akester. I'm from World Fish. I'm the country director of Myanmar. And my question is relates to the CS map presentation. And one of your slides showed the Tonlisap Lake and the fact that there is an extensive flood pulse. And also the fact that in the dry season, there is no drought around the lake, presumably because of the residual water from the flood. So my question is, what percentage of the farmers you worked with noticed or commented that flood is beneficial? Okay, thank you for the question. I'm taking some more questions before coming to you with the answer. There is a question here. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, my name is for the International License in two languages. My question is uh, for the CLP team. Did you mention that the potato and sweet potato can and tolerate uh, 10 years, selling 10 years per meter? When you grow the potatoes and sweet potatoes, and the mass consumption, soil salinity is not a problem. That's true. But uh, if we can irrigate uh, 8 to 10 years per irrigation of that, that would be a great uh, potential for the coastal zone, I believe. So uh, do we have an experience of 
providing irrigation water which is more than eight years per meter salinity. Very interesting question too. Thank you. It gives you time to think, right? Thank yes. you very much for very interesting presentations. I'm Deepa Joshi from EMI. I have two questions. The first one to Amjad Babu, that um, I think digital innovations are really important for Bangladesh for re-energizing the ag sector. But at the same time, our study done last year on digital innovations initiatives shows that there is a big gender divide. And there's also a big internet connectivity divide, um, which is very much related to poverty. So uh, how, how do you intend to address these issues? Do you see that emerging in your work? The next question to our youngest uh, presenter, very dynamic, I loved your presentation. Um, I wanted to say that, you know, when you talked about taking on youth, um, there's also amongst youth a big issue of um, more connected, uh, wealthier youth who have the access perhaps to hackathons like these and urban more marginalized youth who don't have such opportunities. And it's very important, I think, when you're talking of youth entrepreneurship and opportunities for youth to address this social divide. How do you intend to do that? Thank you very much. Two very interesting questions. Okay, now you, you all got questions. I will take three more questions and then I come back to you. One in the back there, then I come to you, and then I come to you. So in the back, is the microphone with you? Yes, yeah. please. Yeah, it is with me. I am Philip from Wagenwin Investing Research. Um, my question is to uh, Dr. Babu. Uh, very nice presentation. Excellent and very interesting work. I was looking at your app. Uh, I have two questions. One, you said you downscale, downscale the forecast of uh, BMD. I would like to know how it's being done. And the second thing is uh, in the forecast, I see that there is forecast for weather. Uh, I would like to know whether you would like to incorporate like water levels and salinity levels in there if it's possible and give uh, bulletins to the farmers. Thank you very much for that question. Then we come to the question up front here. Good morning. Uh, good morning, speakers. And my name is Max Etrud. I'm from Cambodian, World Fish Cambodia. I have two questions. One to go, one go to you know a colleague from Vietnam. Uh, um, the CS mapping is interesting, and you know uh, fishery is important, especially food security for Cambodia. Uh, Eighty percent of protein come from uh, fishery. Um, how you are integrating uh, fishery into uh, your map? Because uh, you know um, this map mainly representing, I would say, agriculture, but but only half rice. So then, but then fish is also important. How you do that? A second question go to my colleague from Cambodia. Uh, um, yeah, agriculture is important, and but then uh, labor percentage in, in Cambodia has been dropped from 50 to now 35 and perhaps lower than that. And then you mentioned you, this is a kind of, a, 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 you know, a, a hope that we could bring agriculture up, but then uh, looking into a uh, youth in, in Cambodia now, agriculture is not their interest and, and migration has been uh, overwhelmed. And and and, and so uh, uh, this is a really question, question, really question about concern over the future of youth and agriculture. And perhaps you know uh, this technology will, will I think uh, will somehow remove you from 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 agriculture. I would say. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for these interesting questions. Then, last but not the least, we have more question. Yes, please go ahead. Deepa Josie's question uh, around uh, inclusion, and just to point out that yes, gender uh, is definitely one major. Um, driver, uh, but especially because we are in South Asia, um, class and literacy are two also very important points that really transcend gender as well. So we to, to look at it more intersectionally. Okay, yeah. and so when looking intersectionally, you want to know about inclusion? The impacts, the you, impacts of literacy, for example. And we want to know from... A, with, with respect to the... Um, oh, advisory. Advisory. Okay. Um, that's the first question. The, the second is not so much a question, but actually a, um, a message to um, the gentleman from, from Cambodia. 
given we are in work package, I come from work package four, it'll be interesting to find out how you plan on actually actioning the climate adaptation plans, particularly at the district level, because that's where we will be working in 2024. So I see opportunities to, to work together. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, is, is this clear, a question clear to you? Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now, uh, I could, uh, I'm not giving you the floor for asking more questions, but I'm first going to ask the people on the stage to answer all your questions. Uh, I'm sure they will not answer all the questions, but that's also not the matter. Uh, I'll come this way down the line uh, and I'll give you the microphone. Uh, can you very shortly, in one or two minutes, address the questions that were asked by the different people? And please feel free to say that you like to talk more with them in the coffee break for details, right? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question to hear from a uh, one page colleagues related to the CS map. Uh, on the slide, if so, uh, you see uh, the toilet sap is there, but actually uh, I get a picture of uh, whole Cambodia. Under AND, we only work on four provinces in the south part of Cambodia, Takel, Prebien, uh, Kandan, Sveirian. Uh, uh, so in th those four provinces, it's not really yeah, uh, have um, fish production, but mainly rice and catch crop. But I do see that people also talk that they they benefit from the flood. Uh, they as they su also success a CFR Muro uh, to in integrate in the rice uh, system, so they have a rice fish system. But uh, I see the scale of the such Muro very small because uh, they have a very small pond. Uh, in within the the field area, especially in Takel, I visited uh, that model already. Yeah. Uh, the second question also related to the uh, uh, CS map. Uh, we we asked the uh, local stakeholder to suggest three most important food product. Uh, uh, cons consider as is is a food crop or or livestock or, or fishery. Most of them mention about crop production, but for for the adaptation plan, they do mention about the livestock and uh, and fishery uh, inclusion in the uh, as an adaptation plan. As you see on the map, a lot of area with the, the size of fish and also the cow. That means that they they plan to have uh, integration of livestock and fishery in the system. So that's also guide the action plan for uh, uh, one fish in the future. Uh, study in the area. Thank you so much yeah. for the answering the questions. Uh, can I get a hand of applause for the uh, answers? And then we can move to yeah. uh, the sweet potato team. Yeah. Let me Thank you. identify you like that. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Ibn Rahman from CIP. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Manon Yunda. He asked a very nice question, actually. Uh, Yes, uh, at this moment, uh, we found that in our uh, field, uh, there is uh, no salinity. Uh, we found uh, at maximum salinity is three in, uh, outside the uh, soil straw and inside in, in the field. Now it's a one to two. So it's not salinity with it. So yeah, uh, we introduced 46 clones in Bangladesh in 2012. And we did two types of trial. One is field trial and one is spot trial. Uh, in the uh, pot trial, we used up to 13 years salinity. So uh, the plants who, uh, those, the genotypes, those dyes uh, below 10, we didn't select. So, uh, and it, 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 uh, it was, uh, actually it has been uh, doing for the last five, uh, five years. Then in 17, uh, field trial results and the pot trial results, it published in the international journals and then in the release. Uh, but uh, when the release, the NSB National Seed Board said that you shouldn't say 13 days, better safely you say uh, 10 days. So, and Barry mentioned that 10 days, only one variety, not the three. And other two variety can tolerate six days. But I earlier mentioned that not at the time of uh, planting, when the plant uh, actually goes up, um, more than 30 days, then if we irrigate uh, six to 10 days salinity level water, not 
our our variety will survive it, and irrigation in the uh, field condition so yeah we did uh, the pot experiment also thank you okay thank you very much uh, and hand of applause for his answers then we move to mr tita matak Okay. What are the questions? You had a lot of questions. Uh, two, actually, yeah. So, um, yeah, thank you for the question. It's very, very, a very, very good question because we kind of like asked that question ourselves as well, just to answer to your question earlier. So how do we make sure that these kinds of opportunities are accessible to other people and especially like youth who are like not in the city or like do not get uh, like the opportunity like this? So uh, just a little bit of background. A lot of Cambodian students who are studying agriculture as a field of a uh, major is very low. Most of them they are studying on scholarships, or most of them they only study because like they are from like the province themselves. So the way we do things, or the way we try to reach out to them, is that we go directly to the school to like do an information session, sharing them about what the program is, and then we try to recruit them to join. Uh, just for your information as well, the participant that joined our hackathon like earlier, they uh, I, around 50, 60 percent of them are from agriculture background. So the idea is that we try to match agriculture students with tech students together and see how much they can come up with new innovations or new ideas because like the agriculture students they have the the the, the expertise they, they study this field and then we have the tech students who are more tech savvy they know how like technology works and stuff so we try to match them together and see what can come out of this and the uh, idea is that we also like reach out to provinces as well so we went down to universities in provinces to kind of like share them about these informations. And I think uh, around 10% of the participants are from the provinces that joined the uh, competition as well. So this is kind of like a way of how we try to make sure that these opportunities are more accessible to those who want to do it and those who really, really want to make something out of it as well. So, so this is what we want to do, uh, what, what we did. And also to answer the question as well, um, yes, a lot of youth, they are not uh, interested in agriculture. That's very, very common in Cambodia. They would rather do something else, but there's a lot of market, there's a lot of demand in agriculture. They just don't know it yet. So that is why we host these kinds of like events, these kinds of like hackathon. We don't just want to do like a seminar, like where people come and then listen about how important agriculture is, but we show them like, hey, there's so many like technologies, there's so many innovations, there's so many uh, cool things happening with agriculture. You can jump in with your expertise, with your ideas, and at the same time, we equip them with entrepreneurship skills. So whatever they found or whatever result they get, they can make a money out of it as well. So this is what we try to tell. Uh, that this is what we try to uh, uh, make sure that the participants or youth knows that this can be possible. And this is how we promote agriculture to students is through these kinds of like activities, not just doing like seminars or workshops or anything like that. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Hand of applause. You can That's go right. ahead, right? Yes, you can go ahead. You have several questions. Okay. So I, I will come club the question from the Pajoshi and the other colleague from Amy. So that was on inclusion. Uh, we are very much aware of uh, the digital divide and its issues, especially with women. So the last year we did a social experiment where we trained a few women uh, with smartphone to use a wisely system. So then ask them to provide this information to 60 women who didn't have any smartphone. It was only normal, uh, the, uh, a normal phone, no? the, the, what do you call that? Uh, yeah, but nope, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what, what we did is for every week, we were calling these women who were receiving the calls from the lead farmers. And then we asked them what you did with this information and tracked along the whole season and understood what are the behavioral changes. And at the end, we also measured how much yield benefit they received because of the information for two crops, that was rice and mung bean. So we found, for example, around one ton of yield increase compared to the control group. We had control and the treated group. So uh, we call this uh, women to women digital service provider model, where a digital service is becoming a service with women. So it's possible to include those women without smartphones into the digital service arena is possible. So we also, we work with microfinance because we thought 
it can be, you know, those people who received the information was microfinance borrowers. So we were thinking a sustainable business model is there. It can be done for other intersectionalities also, uh, but we also tested other systems like interactive voice response, which are more inclusive, which can be directly reaching. And the second question is about uh, the downscaling of forecast. So uh, what I want to tell you is we have uh, we have struggled with this because uh, we received the grid-based forecast, uh, a net CDF file from BMD, and we actually downscale it to the points within Dobozilla. And, you know, so we do that, but sometimes there is a breakage in the pipeline of data flow. So uh, what we have done is uh, we have now have an agreement with the RIMES, who are who is also providing us with the downscale the Obzilla level forecast directly to the core system. So that work is going on, and we have also made another backup to use uh, UK Met data. So if these two data streams fail, there is a third backup so that our service will be always active. It's a bit complex, but we have done that. Of course, we can include salinity and other parameters, but the main issue, because we want to expand multiple more crops, more issues, but the main issue is getting scientific literature. No, for a, what is the salinity level for this particular crop? Maybe it's available for potatoes or for rice, but not for other crops. For the you know the temperature, rainfall, salinity thresholds, or each you know each parameter thresholds for different crops is not yet available. There is not of basic research that needs to be done before we advise. So we don't actually uh, you know depend on expert advice on that. So. That's one reason why we are not adventuring, but we are really interested how we can actually integrate. And can I say one more point? Yes, you can. <laughs> so one more thing is uh, I'm, I'm going to maybe next uh, cycle of our funding, I want to do something like, you know, you don't need to depend on one app, you know, for Agwisely it's a climate service app, which also will have state specific good agri agriculture practices now integrated into system. So it has a value proposition by itself. But what I think is it can be combined with other digital apps, you know, which has other capacities. You don't need to integrate everything into an app. There can be multiple apps with different capacities. Only thing is how that ecosystem can work together. So it needs further investigation. I, I, I look forward to such uh, questions. Yeah, thank you. Okay, in, 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 uh, uh, I'm not sure if I understood his last sentence correctly. He needs the ecosystem for the app. Uh, do, do you mean that, because currently this app is in Bangladesh, right? Yeah. Uh, anybody from Bangladesh who has this app on his phone? Or no, it's only for, only for extension offices right now. It's uh, not... but, but anybody can download, right? We have to approve. I mean, uh, there is a registration system. There's a registration. Also, only agriculture offices can download. No, but we want to make it more open and, uh, you know, but okay. for and, the time being. Uh, yesterday, we had the HSBC bank yeah. uh, officer here who said you always need to have a good exit strategy. Yeah. So what is your exit strategy? <laughs> or that will also be part of your next step? No, I, I'll tell you there are two exit strategies for us, okay? because there are two scaling pathways. One is scaling pathways to through the extension system. So there is a, approximately 10,000 extension officers active in Bangladesh. That's, even DA does not know exact number, mm -hmm. but uh, we have 8,000 of them in our extension, uh, our system. Mm -hmm. Means we are all, already reaching yeah, yeah, yeah. Huge maximum number. level. So uh, the other is to, uh, to, to the banks because they are providing so much of loans. And this can actually support to to like an insurance, you know. So it's not insurance, but a kind of uh, assurance that they may get through the climate issues and harvest the crop, you know, if they give a crop loan. So we are they can actually provide funds to the application. We are not yeah, expecting funds. Is providing funds for the application. This is part of your current work. It's not. But what we are thinking is we have to go for the next scaling directly through banks or any financial institution so that we can generate some fund because DAE can take it and operate it their own. That's one possibility. Or at least government is running that application or it can be private led. I mean, private finance is ready to support the system. You know, okay. I, I understand there is a next session on scaling. So undoubtedly this point will come back. I think this is very critical issue, right? That how 
to get any, because so far, my experience in Bangladesh, I have not seen any app that made it after the project. Right? So, oh, yes, please. One please. point I can tell you is because in AMD, I have a uh, what uh, section where I'm building business models mm -hmm. for digital application. And the first one I have selected is interactive voice response system. I'm building a business model for it as exit strategy. So if anybody is interested, I can talk about it. Okay, this is an invite. Anybody interested? More information. Uh, let me also come down the line. Uh, uh, very interesting to hear about uh, this hackathon. Uh, and the, you mentioned that later you will be uh, also uh, working on a business incubator. Um, I, I find it very interesting. I, I, I work at Wageningen University and Research and we do similar things. Um, and uh, our experience is that there are a lot of small scale uh, um, uh, innovation projects starting uh, with that. Um, and, it's, and it's really kind of uh, getting off because now some, sometimes some uh, businesses are coming to us because they are interested in these kind of activities. Uh, what is your experiences with businesses in that regard? Uh, business coming to... To, 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 to see your innovations because they want to pick the brains of all these bright people that you collect. Right. So um, at Impact of Phnom Penh, uh, where I'm working, uh, we have been doing this for the past uh, nine years. And uh, we have worked with a lot of businesses, actually. Uh, one of the biggest telecom company in Cambodia, we work with them like on an annual basis as well to run something similar to not specifically on agriculture, but on other like field and sector as well. So uh, we kind of like do kind of like a partnership thing with a lot of these company where for them, they really wanted new like ideas, new uh, 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 startups to come out. So they come to us and we help de develop the curriculum, do the trainings and organize the whole thing. And at the end of the day, we do like one final pitch where all the participants, all the teams, they come up and then they kind of like share their ideas and their, their startups to people. And if their startup ideas got selected or it's like the best startup ideas, they will get like additional funding on top. So like earlier, like the five teams that were selected from the program, they just get a small seed funding of $500 to actually test out their idea. So whatever they did during the hackathon, they will need to test it or make a prototype out of it. So we gave them this like small seed of money this is small, but to them, this is like everything. This is like so much thing that they can do. So we hopefully can get something out of that as well. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting model to hear that selecting the promising ones and then adding up with the finance. Yeah. Maybe for research, that's also interesting, right? That you have a round where some people could qualify for additional research yeah. money. Thank you very much. Thank you. I like to the sweet potato team. I like to ask about the university that because you have this important new breeding information on sweet potato, how does that kind of translate into your university program? Do, do you take up some of that in your university program to discuss also with the students? Uh, yes, uh, see, uh, thank you. Uh, a good number of MS students, master students are working, one PhD student is working, and undergraduate students are also participating to learn the research. So this way capacity is building. Okay, very interesting. And as you are standing beside uh, our hackathon friend, <laughs> that this kind of approach, do you think your students would also be interested in this kind of thing? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. So, so maybe the idea about a hackathon of sweet potato gets born here, right? Some of our undergraduate students are working as a volunteer. They are very interested to learn actually research. Okay, thank you. So interesting to hear. And uh, about the climate uh, mapping uh, exercises, uh, already you, you answered the question uh, about this. You are making the maps. The maps are in a way an annual map, right? That is, you have one map for the whole year, or you have map on the seasons also? Um, we develop a map for season, but for season. the map can be updated once they want to update, or they have a something change in background, like the new infrastructure, uh, um, a new warning of climate risk, or the different definition of, of, of the, the risk. They can redo it. Yeah. Okay. In general, researchers like maps, right? 
Yeah. Did anybody of the researchers in AMD already ask you for your maps? Um, the the map in in under this AMD we have done for Vietnam and complete for um, uh, 13 provinces already say online. Many uh, researcher approach us and ask for the map. In Cambodia, we just finished the uh, mapping and now still in the post, uh, process to make it online available. And uh, we do not have to request, yes, but as uh, far as uh, discussed with the map and uh, technical working group, they want to access the map and also scale it in other provinces, at least for, for um, Cambodia. In Bangladesh, we also on the progress to make it available very soon. Okay, and uh, with regard to the exit strategy, because once you have the maps, how do they uh, remain active also after you will complete your part of the assignment? Um, we conduct a training. So I think that it's a very important part that we transfer that practice, that uh, technology to the local uh, research partner. So in all three countries under AMD, we conduct a training and also uh, hand over the, the uh, technical document to the local partner. So I'm sure that people can, can uh, replicate the work after project finish if they, they want to. Okay. Yeah. Okay, did, did, could you all hear the answer that the local partner then, uh, okay, and from your local partner, somebody is here? Yeah, uh, we have uh, CZGS from Bangladesh here, uh, the Mr. Ali, uh, Champa, and other I can see uh, here. Okay, can, yeah. can I have a microphone? Uh, let me work there. So let's ask this question about the local partner. I'm, I'm harassing you with a question. Yeah, uh, my name is Chomper Nisha from CEGIS. Can you please repeat the question, please? Yeah, sorry to uh, harass you with the question just on the spot. But we learned from the presentation that there are these kind of interesting maps being produced and uh, we learned from the presentation yesterday that it's important to have exit strategy. So you always need to make sure that what you prepare also gets somewhere. And then uh, the good thing of the AMD program, as Dr. Bui uh, explained to us, is that he working with the local partner and the local partner received the training and then through the local partner, these maps can be available for many other researchers or implementing partners, etc. So uh, for CGIS, uh, do you have a plan to put the maps uh, in the online uh, after the after uh, the work will be? especially DA, you will be there where we'll be sharing all the maps and then we have a plan to publish also in online. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Mustafa Ali from CGS. Yes, uh, we had a very wonderful interaction with uh, especially many stakeholders out of them. DA is one of the uh, like uh, very eager, uh, I would say that uh, uh, partners. So uh, uh, with this phase, we have done uh, a bit uh, kind of not full scale mapping, um, uh, but we have done some kind of initial stage and we have engaged with uh, through different uh, activities with DAE and we have been uh, discussing with them that uh, how this can be up scale through different government initiative. So not... Uh, through ERI or not through AMD, but would like to uh, uh, pilot this further because at this moment we have done in 10 districts uh, and uh, only few upozilas. So we we'll, would like to scale this out uh, by discussing with uh, uh, different uh, officials at the headquarters level 
and we are uh, very confident that uh, this will be scaled out in other areas uh, as they have shown their interest. And of course, we'll put it online very soon. I think, I don't know whether this said. I, I, I think, so. are you satisfied, uh, Dr. Bui, with the answer? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry for putting you on the spot, but as we have these uh, local partners here, we like, also have a local partner from Cambodia here. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. You, <laughs> want, you want them to answer the question too? No. If you want to extend. Okay. Uh, I, I I like to, to I like to kind of complete a bit in yeah, time okay. because the organizer gave me time limit. So thank you for pointing that out. And yeah. anybody who wish to ask the Cambodian national partner also, they can tell. Very happy to hear for the action. Um, having said that, um, I like to ask another big hand of applause for all our presenters. And uh, uh, please, you may be seated again. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, on your program, I'm following your program. Uh, I have been asked to do synthesis. I, I think by having this extra round of uh, more questions, we have an excellent synthesis uh, in, in that regard. Uh, I'm very happy that with having said that, we are almost at the end of our Delta Talks live. I, I do think life is very different than on the screen, right? I like life. Um, but if we need to do on the screen, it saves the environment. It gives us opportunity to communicate. So we will go uh, with the online sessions. Um, besides the big thanks for the speaker, I also want thanks for this special live session for the team of organizers who, uh, out of your knowledge, has done all this work. So please, the on-site team, a big hand of applause for them. And separately, uh, in online, we also have uh, Eisen, who is not here, right? So I want a big hand of applause for Eisen. Because without his support, this kind of things would not happen. And uh, really, uh, this uh, makes things possible. Like Ola already said, we have a plan for the coming year, but you know, Plans can always change. Some people may be available or they may not be available. Sometimes the research result is a bit delayed. So people like to reschedule. So if you have some suggestion for that you would like to present or that you would like to hear from somebody else about their research, feel free to approach me and me and where are you? Me and for uh, mentioning to her your topics that you would like to present. And if you like to present from one work package with another work package possible from uh, one partner inside AMD to partner outside AMD possible, all different combinations are possible. We encourage that. We encourage you to continue the discussion uh, in the Netherlands Food Partnership platform in online. Uh, if you want to post something there, if you want to ask questions, if you want to uh, be in contact with other parties, like for instance, uh, our hackathon partner, if you also kind of uh, look for other parties like that, feel free to continue the discussion there. Having said that, I now look at uh, Ola, have I said everything I need to say? He's satisfied. Okay, thank you all very much. Um, this was a very pleasant experience to be here all together. If you have more questions, feel free to ask. 